This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Matt Zaglin, Kelly Cook, and Scott Hepburn. Coming up on DTNS, Microsoft's new Thunderbolt 4 dock is getting a lot friendlier. Google says our bad about the whole Google Drive caps thing. And let's meet our new astronauts. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, April 4th, 2023, from lovely Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Rich Trapolino. From Off Off Broadway, I'm Ayaz Akhtar. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Hey, we got Ayaz here, and that means we should probably get going with the quick hits. Here we go. In all of these months of massive big tech layoffs, Apple remained one of the few holdouts. But now Bloomberg's Mark Gurman reports Apple started its first round of layoffs since it began cost-cutting measures late last year. We don't have estimated numbers, but it supposedly involves a small number of roles in its development and preservation teams, which works at construction and maintenance of global Apple facilities, including its retail stores. The social network Post opened a public beta. Post launched in November 2022 with a closed beta when every other Twitter-like social network suddenly saw a lot of interest. The platform's main draw was working with publishers to let users read articles directly in their feeds through micropayments. Publication partners include The Boston Globe, Fortune, The Independent, Insider, LA Times, ProPublica, Reuters, Semaphore, SF Chronicle, MIT, Technology Review, USA Today, and Wired. Can't leave Wired out. Oppo confirmed it placed its business in Germany on hold, but that it is not leaving the German market. This comes after Oppo and OnePlus halted new smartphone sales in Germany last year due to a patent dispute with Nokia around 5G technology. Motorola announced a flagship phone for Western markets, the Edge 40 Pro. It's largely the same as the X40 released in China late last year. With typical 2023 flagship specs, a Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 SoC, 165 hertz screen, 125 watt wired charging, and IP68 rated for water and dust. It comes to Europe in the coming days for 900 euros, then to Latin American markets. We still don't know if the device will come to North America, but Motorola said in its press release, it's excited to share its commitment to expand the Edge family in North America this year. I'm glad Motorola is excited. That, that makes my day. PayPal's advanced checkout integration can now accept Apple Pay payments from customers. Advanced checkout allows merchants to create more personalized checkout experiences for their shops. It's been around for a while, and it already has uh, an integration with Venmo, PayPal, and credit cards. The idea is it lets you get a more branded experience for a merchant. Advanced checkout also added the ability for customers to save cards to a secure vault for that particular business. The idea is a customer wouldn't need a PayPal account specifically, but could still have their card info saved securely with that merchant. All right, we've got some Microsoft news. They announced the Surface Thunderbolt 4 dock. It's a catchy name uh, for $299.99. The new dock connects with USB-C. That's notable because it doesn't use the proprietary Surface Connect port. Microsoft says it will keep selling its Surface Dock 2, which does include the Surface Connect port, that it's made for Surface devices that don't have USB-C or Thunderbolt 4. Now, now, why is this interesting? It's because the Surface Thunderbolt 4 dock is the first to support devices other than Surface for the first time. Along with USB-C support, it also supports data transfer speeds of up to 40 gigabits per second and 96 watt charging using Thunderbolt 4. In front is a USB-C and USB-A port. In the back, two USB-C ports, two USB-A ports, a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port, an audio jack, and a security lock slot but there's no SD card slot for some reason. Uh, so clearly, Microsoft is trying to adapt to what it believes people need. Rich, so in the spirit of that, what do we need? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the question. Do Well, I guess the biggest question Microsoft is hoping is, do we need a Microsoft-specific Thunderbolt uh, hub when, for the longest time, the big differentiator was, well, if you have a Surface device, you know, the, the Surface Dock made a, a lot of sense. You already had that Surface Connect port. Um, honestly, for me, the SD card is probably the biggest uh, exclusion or or if you're, a, I, I'm a photographer kind of guy. So uh, maybe a CF Express card slot if you want to be like super forward facing. 
but I don't know. I'm sure this is an extremely well-made device. They're not price gouging. All of these Thunderbolt docks are right around that like 250 to $400 range. So this is right in the middle of that. If you look at something like OWC is the one I always think of when it comes to these kind of things. Um, I, for me, this kind of lockdown thing, what I'm actually interested in is I want the framework version of a Thunderbolt dock. That's just a bunch of USB-C or Thunderbolt over USB-C ports on there. And I can have little modules to kind of dock in there. I, I mean, does, does that sound crazy to you, Ayaz? That sounds like a very clean way to do pretty much what we, I think everyone's doing right now. You might get like two or three USB-C ports and then you got to attach a dock to that. And then you got to either have a, a dock that has more USB-C ports, or they have USB-A ports. And what's supposed to be a super clean, easy kind of system turns into what I'm looking at on my desk right now. This like looks like spaghetti everywhere. There's <laughs> wires going everywhere because not everything uses C to C cables. Not everything uses C to A cables. So you've got to keep messing around with these old devices. Then you've got your, your legacy stuff of like your micro USB to A. You got all of these freaking standards. The idea of the framework dock, if that was an actual thing, or basically, you're taking the dongle and making it like a little card, right? You're just going to have these small expansion ports. I'm just, I think the concern is probably about the cost on that. If you're going to put Thunderbolt on these things, it's going to be pricey, pricey, pricey. I just want like a ton of USB C. Just label some like USB C and they tell you it's like five gigabits, and the other one's 10, and the other one's like 40 because it's got, um, I think it's USB, whatever. Somebody's going to get that one right in the, in the comments somewhere. <laughs> you have varying speeds, so you don't have to pay to have all that power for every single port. Yeah. And the other thing that's interesting about this is it kind of completes the turnaround for Microsoft when it comes to this, because the Surface Connector has kind of gotten a lot of flack in recent years for being like, that's this proprietary thing. We have USB-C. You have to remember when it first came out, it was 2014. It was pre, you know, the idea of, oh, we have this one port, uh, Thunderbolt or USB-C that can kind of do everything. Apple didn't do, uh, you know, that that first uh, generation of like, we're doing all USB-C Thunderbolt ports uh, until 2016, right? So you had, they, they were kind of following Apple's lead with MagSafe, except it was also a connector. Oh, this is like, it does two in one. It's not just you don't have to take up space on your laptop with just a connector. It can be this cool accessory port. And they were going to carry it through for generations to allow you to, hey, you don't have to buy a new charger when you get your new Surface device. All your accessories are still going to work with this cool port. And it just so happened that Thunderbolt and USB-C took off in a really huge way, but no small part because of Apple, uh, and kind of then made that a, a little bit of a kludge, which is then weird because now Apple makes MagSafe again which is basically a single use port that's taking up space that they got a ton of credit for, for reintroducing back into their laptop. Like, it's just a weird reversal for me on this. It is It is a bit strange. I'm thinking about the, the, the cheers that people had when it came to MagSafe coming back and they're like, oh, you free up a USB-C port. That's great too. So like it, it, my, my answer to that is like, just throw in another USB-C in there if you can, especially if you can support the amount of power demands that this laptop or any other computer is gonna have. Um, it, it's it's a strange strange world we're in. It looks like if Microsoft is letting this go and and Apple's going to do what Apple does, I'm not going to yeah. mess with that. Yeah. But like this idea that the Surface Dock can be used for things that are not the Surface at all, and that actually is better for Microsoft in general. If they want to sell hardware, I don't think they're going to get like a halo effect from a Microsoft Surface Thunderbolt 4 dock. Like, oh, this is really <laughs> great. I, I want to buy a Surface, but at least when you've, you you know it works with the Surface no matter what, and now it works with stuff that's not the surface at all. So I think that could be a, a benefit to a lot of people out there who are looking for a solid, well-built device that likely will, like the company will exist tomorrow because a lot of these other USB-C docks I see sometimes, they're by companies you never heard about. And I'm like, yeah, can I can I trust the one-year warranty? Will they be here in, in three months? I don't know. The one thing with the lack of the SD card slot, I just thought of this. Maybe this is a signal that Microsoft plans to be putting SD card slots in all of their surface devices for the foreseeable future. In that case, I'm okay with it not being on the dock. If you got, as long as I got it, that's all I care about. I want less dongle in that situation. Wishful thinking for less dongle. <laughs>
Well, one thing we don't have wishful thinking about is the status of live audio chat rooms, Ayaz. Can you fill us in on some of the latest developments here? Yeah, so along with Jobs, one of the other things that seems to be on every company's cut list is live audio experiences. Last year, Meta cut many of its audio products, and now Spotify announced it will kill off its dedicated Spotify live app. I know all of you are really worried about that. There's millions of you out there who use it, but it's probably not too surprising. Since it canceled much of its live audio content back in December, Spotify still says it sees a future for live fan creator interactions in the Spotify ecosystem. Yeah, so all of you Spotify Live fans, pour some out. But just remember, as Spotify Live dies, Title Live lives Yay. that that streaming provider title has announced live as a way to let subscribers share live dj sets with other subscribers uh and this will be featured uh, on your home screen with from your friends so if anyone you're following is on there as well as featured from curated live uh set lists on their home page so they're kind of providing a way to do it definitely a different take on this shared but still live audio experiences you know we're seeing this decline in the chat room uh kind of uh, uh we, we saw it kind of blow up during the pandemic i as does user generated music seem like it will have maybe more staying power on this front i think the way title live would be working i think it would make sense because people are tuning into essentially somebody's playlist or radio station it's like hey look how great my music is i want to share that with people and so people can kind of go around that i never really understood the idea of things like clubhouse and and these audio forums it's like didn't we as a society all agree we don't want phone calls we don't want to talk we want to see text and then if we want to join in on something we'll all like show up to like a theater or something and then someone will present so you can have a small club you go okay i'll pay attention to this but you got like Anybody can come in. Anybody can talk. You're basically on the subway. So why on earth <laughs> would you ever want this as a product? I mean, I guess there was a loneliness during the pandemic. Yeah. Oh, I want to get a voice. I need a voice. And I don't always want to use a camera. I get that. But I think a lot of it is, you know, if somebody's presenting something, you can have an audio community around them. Like, I don't know, anything ever at this point or video people around them going, oh, yeah, I'm going to join in because I'm actually ready to do this. And then they could always default back to the nice safety of an actual text-based chat room. So that's what I think on that. Yeah, I, I do feel like like Discord certainly stepped in to, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, fill that gap where it's like, oh, this is a community I'm already in that has a, like a mission and a functionality. I don't have to seek it out in whatever uh, uh, kind of, it's not grafted onto something I'm using like Twitter or Spotify, mm -hmm. or I don't have to go to this whole new community in Clubhouse or something like that. I, I do feel that's part of it. Definitely the loneliness. Like it, it is it is easy to forget where we were all mentally, like in 2020, 2021, depending on you know how long you'd been at home and, and your situation there. So I could I totally could can, can see the rise of this. What's interesting though, this is not a new idea what uh what title is doing here. I mean, certainly like turntable FM uh back in the day was this the very much this kind of idea it wasn't the most uh you know licensed idea it wasn't tied into monetization the way a, a music streaming provider is these days and spotify itself tried something like this uh, they still offer it it's called group sessions and this came out same thing uh in uh, in the pandemic remote group sessions i should say they have kind of a two different in room and and, and remote sessions but Unlike Spotify's vision of this was very, you're going to share it with a specific number of people. So you would share like a, a URL with up to seven people that could all join and they contribute to the playlist. Title is very much a curator playlist. So even if they're your friend, you're trusting them to do all of the curation within this, right? There's no, there's really no interaction built into it at all, other than uh, you can see how many people are kind of viewing your thing. It feels a little bit more, I mean, honestly, it feels like it's it's more focused on creators right in the same way that you would do like a youtube live or something like that and yeah you can have people watching that i i do think it's weird that there is no community element to that and the other thing that's weird is this is all subscriber based right you have to be a title subscriber to be able to access this like if you click on the link that someone shares with you you either have to send it for a free trial or you can't access it in any way does that seem like I, i'm thinking of this from a growth perspective like how does that help title grow when it's already a very niche player. And that sounds like a really dumb thing when you just said that. So uh, how does it help him grow? I'm going to try to answer that question as if I was title. So here's how here's how I figure this works. Uh, people are going to see these wonderful playlists uh, done by their friends. They really want to know what Rich, his, his title playlist is. And it's so amazing. You're like, I am going to sign up. It's going to be so easy to sign up. And then I, 
will become a subscriber. And then I will create my own playlist, which I will also share. And then I will invite more people. And then I'll invite two, two more people and so on and so, <laughs> so on. So on and so on, yeah. <laughs> like that gum commercial from like 1992. 1980 1942 i don't know what it was it was a long time ago but maybe that's it but like otherwise the idea that you can't just share and let people listen and go oh actually i like the experience i like the the audio quality i like uh the ease of use of this product to give it a differentiation factor that seems a little bit short-sighted but if they're just trying to grow it's 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 a way to go i just don't know if it's going to like spark i don't believe this is like the killer feature for title i think their main thing is audio quality not uh shareability yeah, well, and uh, and also like artist, their whole artist equity kind of uh, uh, vibe to it. And that's really what feels like the limiting factor for this, right, is that they have to worry about like how they're going to, uh, you know, uh, pay for these tracks, right? It's not like Turntable FM where it's fly by night and we're, we're fudging all the details that we get taken down and stuff like that. I, I mean, this is, title, uh, uh, title is very specific in saying, if you have five friends and they're all listening to us, that artist gets credit for five streams, you know, when you're when you're sending that out there. So uh, that is very much tied into this. And, and I could see that being a benefit as well. It's like, oh, I'm a fan of this artist. I'll join this stream and hey, maybe they can, you know, it, like, those kind of social dynamics, I, I feel like, but I'm just shocked that there's not some, they can't figure out some way to do like display ads. They have an ad supported tier, right? Like they, they have that business model built in. You think they could find some way to have it help ca cast a wider net for their, for their service. It'll be the big addition of a new feature is like not for non-subscribers in like three months. And we're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's still around. We'll see how long this lasts. Yeah. We'll, 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 uh, wait for the quick hit of title live is also not alive anymore. Uh, but one thing that is alive is know a little more. It's Tom's podcast to do deep dives into individual topics and it's coming back. It lives this Thursday and it's better than ever if you have not yet checked out the show go get subscribed right now the first episode in the relaunch is all about about rss or a really simple subscription it's rocky history and how it ended up being the underpinnings of podcasting you may be familiar with that medium if you're listening to the show don't miss it subscribe by thursday at knowalittlemore.com <laughs> Well, one of the big stories of the day, Google is reversing its decision to put a file creation cap on Google Drive. Here's some background and might, might affect you. About two months ago, Google rolled out a 5 million file cap on all Google Drive users, including people paying for extra storage. So not just, you know, your, your, your free tier people, but nobody had a heads up about it. So understandably, some users logged in to realize that they had millions of files over this new limit and were not able to upload new files until they deleted enough to go under that limit. And in some cases, you know, there were millions of files over that anyway. Personal users and businesses were both impacted by this change. So Ars Technica spoke to a Google spokesperson who said the file cap was not a bug and was actually, quote, a safeguard to prevent misuse of our system in a way that might impact the stability and safety of the system, end quote. The company says it rolled the limitation out to stop what it called misuse of Drive. Google also said it intends to explore alternate approaches to ensure a great experience for all. Yeah, that's uh, we got to have those great experiences, right? As when it comes to all of our cloud storage. But the problem with limiting Drive is that Google charges people for Drive storage. Google Workspace business accounts go up to five terabytes of storage for normal accounts. And you might even have technically unlimited options available if you call Google and negotiate. Google One, that's the consumer level option for more Google storage, caps out at 30 terabytes and costs $150 a month. Drive also is in a storage bucket of its own since Google encourages developers to build the Drive API into their apps and add cloud storage products or adds cloud storage into their products. You know, I as this has kind of been a story that's brewing. I, I you know, I've seen reports uh, of people kind of pointing this out and Google finally has kind of gone on the record to say, I, <laughs> I think it's remarkable to say, hey, this is not a bug. Uh, I mean, if you logged in and I had to delete a couple million files, it kind of would ruin your day, right? 
I, I think so. I mean, it'd be a question why I have so many dang files in the first place. But I mean, the, the thing, the biggest thing that annoyed people is that they didn't say anything ahead of time. And Google did say that they will, from now on, give users warning. Didn't say they wouldn't do it again. It just says, okay, we're going to let you know if we might do something like this again. It's it's such a crazy idea. Like, here's this thing. I probably would not have been annoyed by the idea that Google could limit the amount of files I could put on there. I already have a terabyte limit or two terabytes, whatever, my, whatever I'm paying for. But then to find out it could be 5 million files. Like, they don't give you a stat on there. There's no counter on that. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I start thinking, do I have 5 million files? No, I don't have 5 million. It's impossible, right? No, or is it possible? I don't know. I've got terabytes of junk that I've I've thrown to Drive. I've moved from different cloud storage options. I have consolidated all to Drive. Are there millions of, like, little .ds store but, uh, files that are garbage? Yeah, probably, because I, I, they would always be created on my Macs because I was using, like, an NTFS uh, across... Class platform sharing would lead to a lot of garbage file creation, which I would then upload back to my cloud store. So this could be a problem for very weird people. But <laughs> if you're also using Drive for your business, that is a whole other uh, can of worms. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we dug into the terms of Dropbox or Box or uh, iCloud or anything like that and see that there is some there is some term in there that company X allows for the limit of blah, blah, blah. If you go over a certain usage or you, you're deemed to be abusing the system. I mean, the, the, the sin here is not necessarily that they would institute a cap. It's that they just turned it on and didn't tell anybody ahead of time. And our secretary did a great uh, uh, job pointing this out in their coverage of this, that Google Workspace maintains like a calendar of, of policy change rollouts. They, they are very careful because they know they're competing with Microsoft, who has a pretty good track record when it comes to like rolling out these changes, letting admins know, hey, the, you know, there's going to be new policy enforcements going on. We're going to start, you know, blocking these macros by default or something like that. You need to be prepared for that. It's like a big deal in the world of productivity. And if Google Workspace and Google Workspace wants to compete in that space, generally they do a pretty good job of letting you know. It seems baffling that. Google would just turn this on unless they had evidence of, you know, they mentioned misuse or stability and safety, but I don't know what, I mean, obviously like someone could be hosting malware, someone could be using it for, you know, some sort of horrible uploads or something like that. And this is like targeted at a very specific subset of users, but we saw people complaining that, you know, uh, the example that was going around was, you know, there was a business in a uh, uh, veterinary care industry that all of a sudden couldn't access any of their files or, or couldn't upload uh, new stuff because they were building everything on Google drive. And all of a sudden they got cut off from that. I, that to me, obviously, is is the the biggest uh, problem here. The one note to to have though is that this was to individual like Google Drive accounts. If you were sharing files with a bunch of other people, the shared files did not count against your you know your file cap or something like that. Because I know I was worried about that. I have a lot of audio files, weird Audacity files that have ten thousand files each of them and stuff like that. But a lot of those are shared, so I wasn't I'm not taking up someone's cap space and stuff like that. I mean, I think the story would have been much larger if people had titled it, and nobody should do this. You know, puppies and kittens endangered by Google Drive. Okay, <laughs> that's that's possible here, and people love their puppies and ki kittens and everything else. So the thing is that if, if that one particular case does sound pretty um, interesting, but that some a lot of that, like you were saying, this particular use case scenario, and you you got to be ready for this stuff. And that sounds really like cold, I know. But like, I've learned my lesson that the amount of times I've had, oh, I only have one drive and it's local. Yeah, that's not a good idea. You know, I have a cloud storage, I got a backup, I got a local backup, I got another cloud storage thing. That's solid. So that's probably good advice for anybody else out there who is, um, you know, depending on one company. Yeah, building a mission critical app and like a file sharing service like Drive, I know they have APIs. I'm not saying that Google is in any way right of doing this, but Use something that's like S3 compliant that just just that has a service level agreement that you signed. Like, do that. Please do that. That's that's all I'm asking you to do. Uh, the other thing I'm asking you to do is pay attention to NASA because they just announced the Artemis 2 mission uh, crew that's going to be going to the moon. So let's have a little drum roll, please. I don't I don't have a drum actually. So I'll go. We have Commander Reed Weissman, Victor Glover, and Christina Hammock Kosh, or Koch, excuse me, representing the US, along with the Canadian Space Agency's Jeremy Hansen. 
the four-person crew will spend up to 21 days in an Orion capsule that will spend around 42 hours in high Earth orbit before touring the moon and then splashing down in the Pacific Ocean. Specifically, they'll be going around the moon the moon so here's a who's who uh christina hammock coach is uh, known as a space uh is known in space land for already achieving the longest stay in space by a female astronaut reed wiseman is a navy pilot who has also been a test pilot for the f-35 lightning 2 program victor glover was part of the first operational crew dragon mission back in 2021 and jeremy hansen is a fighter pilot and one of four current Canadian astronaut. So good on you, Canada, for representing. Artemis 2 is set to launch in November 2024 and will represent the first time humans have flown to the moon since Apollo 17 in 1972. Are you marking your calendar for Artemis 2, Iaz? I'm freaking psyched. Uh, uh, there's the, the jokey part of me that wants to talk about the Transformers or something, but like this is exciting that there's actually like, you know, scientific, like money going into science and, you know, people going to space, not because they just want to see, you know, the part of the, the curvature of the earth. This, you know, it's <laughs> actual research stuff. It's not a bunch of like wacky billionaires being a bunch of, can't say the words here, but yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's nice to see actual human accomplishments that will probably benefit society and not, you know, Rivian when they have that <laughs> I, I've been watching uh, For All Mankind uh, uh, on Apple on the Apple TV Plus. So this is all about moon stuff and mm -hmm. and alt futures and stuff like that. So I'm. It's nice to see that there is uh, uh, in an actual reality. We're we're going back to the moon. And I have little kids, so I'm super psyched to be watching all of these launches and uh, and seeing those updates. So I'm seeing them through their eyes. I think that'll be super cool. really some really high quality video and imagery than we would probably have not gotten in a long time. Obviously we've got telescopes and things for that, but like this is going to be something else. They're they're going to be using their phones, I guess. They're they're going to be busting <laughs> out. It's going to be like a space hardened like Samsung Galaxy S2 or something like that. They have to use something real old. It's going to be they're going to use that Apple satellite feature. It's like well, we're near we're near them. <laughs> we're on a satellite. Does this account? It's like nah. We'll see. The one, the one thing that makes me sad is that they won't bring the Hasselblads back to the moon. That makes me sad as a film photography guy, but that's okay. But one thing that makes me happy is we got some stuff in the mailbag. Let's check it out. On episode 4486, this comes into us from Bernie. Uh, we were talking with uh, Aaron Carson about the future of AI audiobook uh, narration. Bernie was thinking about what AI will do to certain industries, and the field of audiobooks is one uh, that I could see to have some potential jobs arise as AI is used more. As the seasoned audiobook narrators get older, they could strike a deal to punch up the AI when more emotion or context with more emotion or context and let the AI do the rest and discuss this becoming the norm. The upshot is that the library profile uh, the library profile voice that will be licensed will continue to generate income long after the narrator gets older and loses the ability to perform audiobooks. May not pay well, but you'll receive a uh, an income longer in the future. Uh, yeah, uh, I imagine the voice licensing uh, game for AI will be uh, will be quite strong uh, going forward. There'll be that, and then you'll have uh, the person impersonators who can fill in when the seasoned people are out. And this is this is a just a wild idea. I'm just thinking about like when we were talking about the moon stuff. I'm like, should I just put it in the like oh, a chat GPT and like make funny point about Transformers and Moon? Like I could have just done that. <laughs> Yeah, we really just need the the IAS bot. Uh, well, if you have any other thoughts about uh, audiobooks or about going back to the moon or uh, uh, Thunderbolt 4 docs that Microsoft is making, send us in at feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We love to get your emails, so please send them in. The other thing we love is having IAS Actar on the show. IAS, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Where can people uh, find more of your great stuff online? Go to thisoldnerd.com. There you'll see a show where I do occasionally, maybe monthly, sometimes weekly, who knows what. But this time, the latest episode is about installing a, a sound bar attached to a mounted television already. The show is all about having the most tech-forward home in life as possible, and the projects are meant to be short. So check it out when you get a chance. Awesome. And thanks also to our brand new bosses, Kiera and Thomas, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Kiera. Thank you, Thomas. You rule. And remember, uh, Kiera and Thomas, as well as our other patrons, stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet, where we'll be talking about how Polaroid de developed a new film that might just make you blue. 
I'm sad or the color. You'll have to stick around and find out. Remember, though, you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. We'll see you there. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs) 